Jennifer Esposito is chair of the Department of Educational Policy Studies and is a professor of research, measurement, and statistics. Her research focuses on how race, class, gender, and sexuality impact experiences of education and how marginalized groups are represented in popular culture. She's also the author of many books and articles that are more than worth your time. In this conversation, we mainly focus on her recent co-authored book, Introduction to Intersectional Qualitative Research. She wrote the book with her frequent collaborator, Venus Evans Winters. Dr. Evans Winters is a former professor of education at Illinois State University in the College of Education with faculty affiliation in Women and Gender Studies, African American Studies, and Ethnic Studies. She's also the founder of Planet Venus and creator of the Write Like a Scholar program. She's also worked with the African American Policy Forum and the Say Her Name Project, led by Kimberly Crenshaw. Venus has a vast research purview, focusing on the social and cultural foundations of education, black feminist thought, critical race theory, educational policy, and qualitative inquiry. There almost isn't enough time to list her achievements, actually, but I'll mention that she's published widely as well. Her books include Reteaching Trayvon, Education for Racial Justice and Human Freedom, and Black Feminism in Education, Black Women Speak, Back, Up, and Out. I was really excited to talk to Venus and Jennifer about their book, which is a completely unique intervention on the purpose and practice of intersectional qualitative research. The book, as you'll hear very soon, is a quote, celebration of their pedagogy over these past 20 years. And for them, a form of political labor that springs directly from the sense of responsibility they feel to address hyper vulnerability. I mean, it's crucial that as Venus points out, at the time of our recording, the Supreme Court of the United States was under fire for threatening to overturn Roe v. Wade and roll back reproductive rights, and that a white supremacist shooter in Buffalo had just gone on a racially motivated murderous rampage after writing a manifesto that maligns people of color for their supposed drain on the social. This is not the world they want to live in. It's a broken world. And so the book, as they'll explain, isn't only pedagogical, it's a political act of resistance. They are trying to create the conditions for a radical rewriting of the rules of the game in academia. From their perspective, intersectional qualitative research is, quote, an intentional disruption of the persistent deficit narrative that keeps white supremacy alive. This deficit narrative starts with the assumption that there's something wrong that must be fixed within BIPOC communities. In Venus's terms, what would it mean instead to embolden those who want to use intellectual activism as a weapon against harm? The effects of this would be widely felt, given that we've largely been hoodwinked, to use Venus's very precise word for it, by a linear narrative that counts only certain texts and voices and styles as valid in academic study. What happens, Venus asks, when we focus on joy, on movement struggles, on meaning making? So we zoom in on the granular question of how thinkers collaborate and write effectively together. It takes, they say, a certain capacity for emotional labor and for a more meaningful and relational kind of accountability. Learning to write together means sharing our rituals, sharing what we think it means to be a contemplative researcher, a quote, ethical researcher, a mindful researcher, a black feminist thinker and researcher. Questioning this insidious assumption that there is, as Jennifer puts it, only one way of writing or thinking critically. Against this, she says that she feels an intense responsibility to help students rediscover their authentic authorial voice. That responsibility to students is a central theme of this discussion. They really emphasize this idea that under the system of neoliberalism that demands the commodification of knowledge and teaches us there are certain knowledges that are just worth more on the free market, they feel that they have to be upfront with students. What they frequently find though is that their students already know or sense that there are certain ways of knowing that are more readily rewarded, and yet they still choose to pursue and produce knowledge that helps their communities. Another main theme is just the task of taking stock of your own situatedness. Dr. Esposito and Dr. Evans Winters explain how they've charted a course from being young scholar activists to the present day, where Venus has, in her words, broken up with her oppressor. And Jennifer feels that her calling is to stay in academia 
and push against the boundaries and the borders to chip away while mentoring other folks that will help her chip away at the steep edifice of higher education in the interest of advancing these core values of authenticity, integrity, and accountability. I invited you, of course, because I was teaching your, you know, path-breaking work, uh, trying to kind of innovate within the, the field of research methods itself, like teaching research methods. And then you pointed me to this, this book that you published, um, a textbook that you published last year, uh, Introduction to Intersectional Qualitative Research. I hope there are, you know, it's the first of many editions of this textbook and that it's taught widely. And I guess I wanted to ask you, first of all, like in terms of the specific moment that this textbook is being published in, um, I wonder if you could reflect on the importance of creating a textbook that is unlike many textbooks that teach research methods, um, uniquely resistant, it seems to me, to the very notion of mastery. Like it's such an empathetic book in many ways. Um, and yet it's still providing all of these tools and techniques for oppositional research, like social justice oriented research. You talk in the book about your excitement in assembling it. You know, it's a decolonial community centered book. And the idea that the writing of the book was a form of political labor. And I guess, it, you know, I was certainly hoping you could speak to that idea of, you know, writing a textbook is a form of political labor. And if there was a way in which you feel other textbooks almost actively work against this idea of the labor of writing and prescribe ways of writing that are mostly about mastery rather than about politics. I, I wanted to first you know, say thank you for inviting us to participate in your podcast. And we're definitely looking forward to digging deeper into the book. Um, Venus and I always say that the textbook represents 20 years of our teaching. And we had talked about writing a textbook many years ago, I think maybe when even when we were still assistant professors. And so when we finally decided, okay, now is the time, we ended up revisiting our lecture notes, some, you know, looking at our assignments and our syllabi in order to understand how we've taught about these concepts over the years. So the book is a celebration of our pedagogy these past 20 years. And we really wanted to focus on the how to's of intersectional research as much as the theoretical aspects behind it. Mm -hmm. And you, you had asked about mastery. Could you, for me, could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. No problem. Like, um, it just seems to me that it's resistant to like that logic of mastery, which it seems to come up, you, you know, all the time in, in pedagogy and sort of theories of education, that that's what you're like imparting to students. Um, but it, it, there's so much of the book that is like actively resisting that on some level and like talking, for example, about um, how you can't write until your basic needs are met and, and talking about like, you know, all of these barriers to writing that exist are like material things, you know, that, that piece is just missing in so many books that are primarily about, um, the tools, just purely about the tools and mastering the tools as though your critical voice comes out of nowhere. You know, if you know what I mean, like this part of, partly comes from my reading of a book called unthinking mastery by Julieta Singh. Um, that sees that idea of mastery as like a deeply colonial pursuit, in fact? Mm. Yeah, Jennifer, you know, it's interesting to me because uh, I think people don't realize this, guy, but Jennifer and I, we grew up together in the business. Hmm. So we actually met as graduate students, very new graduate students too, probably before uh, research was... <laughs> shove down our throats. So um, imagine Jennifer and I as a critical urban intellectual activist, right? A part of the hip hop generation. And we're coming together. So when we started to think about or ponder the purpose of, uh, of research, we were actually theorizing research you know, at this at the time when we were meeting, and so Jennifer talks about you know the re the reality is that all writing is political, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, and when you are writing from the margins, your writing is especially politicized and most especially uh, because it's politicized will be challenged. But I'll, I'll let Jennifer continue with that line of logic on the politics of writing. Yeah, um, we when we think about the political labor involved in writing the textbook, because we do claim it as political labor, we we really borrow that notion from Sarah Ahmed, who said mm -hmm. so much feminist and anti racist work is the work of trying to convince others that sexism and racism have not ended that they matter mm -hmm. and you know, it's easy for people unaffected by racism to not notice its devastating effects. So when you don't have the privilege to not notice because your life and the lives of the people you love are affected by it, noticing racism and, note, and helping others notice it is work. And I think it does matter that we wrote the book in this current, you know, quite conservative political moment. So in the US, there's an assault on women's bodies. There's an assault against teaching truthful history and assault on sexuality. And so our work is even more politically charged. And I think that's what makes it so powerful to many of our readers. Yeah. And, you know, I'm uh, in a position where I'm reading your work. And for example, you've got this co-authored essay where you write about attending an academic conference and being you feel as though you're being perceived as just like maybe one of the students because um, it's a predominantly kind of white dominated uh, conference. Um, and you talk about just feeling hyper hyper visible in many ways in that in that context. Um, and it seems to me that you're trying to kind of let people into those experiences and create a certain amount of room um, for people that, as, as Venus was saying, you know, are, are growing up uh, um, and having research, as it were, kind of shoved down their throats, um, just kind of trying to carve out a space of autonomy that you described the complicated notions of invisibility and hypervisibility. And I wonder, like, after writing this textbook, if you feel especially hypervisible as a bridge for other communicators, scholars, artists of color, um, and how you understand or like internalize now the job of creating access for others given the position that you're currently in. Mm. So I, th I think the, the piece that you're referring to is ethical, I think it was ethical quandaries where we reflected on ourselves as professors in a neoliberal academy. And so the kinds of things that we discussed in that piece are the kinds of things that basically keep us up at night. And I think it's important to note that now in 2022, I'm still in academia, but Venus is not, and it's by choice. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I certainly won't, you know, tell her story. Um, she can do that. But I do remember the day that Venus called me up and said, I broke up with my oppressor. And it was so powerful. So for me, I'm happy she left. She found a different calling and Venus will impact people no matter what she does. For my part, I think my calling is to stay in the academy, but to continue to push against the boundaries and the borders. And I definitely have more race and skin privilege than Venus does. And so I think I can sometimes get away with more things because of that privilege. Um, but it is still exhausting and tiring work, but it's work that I think I need to do. And I remain conflicted by it. But the reality is that black and brown students will continue to pursue the PhD. And if people aren't there to support them, we will continue to be isolated from academia. So what I like to you know, comfort myself with is I think we can make changes from the inside. And the reality is, and I think you know, many may disagree with me here, but we won't be able to burn it all down and start anew. So we have to start chipping away. And I see my role as both chipping away but also mentoring scholars who will then later help me chip away. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and Scott, you know, speaking of breaking up with my oppressor on December 15, 2020 at 12 p.m. Central, you know, <laughs> but who's tracking? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think about that, uh, you know, when you, you mentioned hyper visibility uh, or hyper invisibility, it depends on how you, you look at it from an intersectional lens. Not only are we, you know, in the academy, are we pushing against hyper invisibility, erasure and hyper visibility, but even in the context of the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism, we're also uh, now, you know, even more so coping with hyper vulnerability. I mean, we can't ignore that at the time of this recording, for example, that um, at a time we're supposed to be still being cautious of COVID-19, we're supposed to be, you know, actively, you know, physically distancing, you know, wearing masks, et cetera. You know, Jennifer and I woke up this week to, or last week to Roe v. Wade being challenged, um, and not possibly being supported by the Supreme Court. And we woke up these past this, you know, three or four days ago with a mass shooting that intentionally targeted uh, black bodies. And the killer, the murderer was a white supremacist, 18 year old terrorist. And so, you know, and I was thinking that at, at the risk that we take in in this text, but the risk that Jennifer and I have taken our entire career, even in that space that you're referring to, uh, that was very Eurocentric, uh, very white, you know, bodied, uh, dominated. It's not just attacks on our ways of being and thinking and, and creating as researchers, but our entire physical presence have been challenged for the last 20 years as women and as women of color. Right. Right. And so that's why I kind of snickered like, wow, hyper visibility. Wow. You know, Jennifer and I, we've been playing with that concept now for over 20 years together. But we are also thinking about at any given moment, the precarity of our very existence as we align with institutions. We're taking a risk uh, in this historical moment of anti-Blackness anti-indigeneity, anti-racism, uh, um, and anti, you know, criticality, anti-intellectualism, right? And so, sure. um, and I, I always like to remind Jennifer, not only of our time in the academy, but the simple fact that uh, for me, I've been in this business of education since the age of three, since Head Start, since preschool, and I just never left. And so even my intention of exiting the academy at this particular time is not only to push back against white supremacy as the norm, but really to also preserve myself. Uh, Because I understood that now we're using research and science and public discourse to justify um, the domination of black and brown people and black and brown bodies in our entire material condition. So I felt complicit because the neoliberal academy does that. It makes us complicit. So how do we question, uh, how do we actively resist? And so for me, that in of itself, my complicity, our complicity became an ethical dilemma Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I had to break up with the oppressor so I can do the work from the outside, uh, you know, looking in. Wow. Like this is the whole thing. Like your book has taught me a lot. And just even talking to you to the two of you is teaching me so much because like I can read as a white male settler academic, I can read Sarah Ahmed, you know, what's the use I can read her new book complaint um, and I can begin to understand mostly in the abstract what it means to, as Jennifer was saying, like chip away at these institutions. But as Patricia Hill Collins has pointed out, in many ways, they're designed to, they're set up to really benefit me as an identity, as an individual. Um, and, and at this, you know, same time, like, I think there's a, a degree to which, like, I just desire now to chip away uh, as an ally alongside you, because um, it's not, ju- you know, it's, it's obviously the case that from inside the neoliberal university, there's an idleness. There's a there's mm-hmm. a willingness to, you know, maintain privilege at all costs. There's like you know you you write about this you know in an article um, called a collaborative article called researching the bridge called our backs. 
you all, you know, are reflecting on sort of the hegemony of certain kinds of research methods. And Jennifer, you, you talk about how you actively went and tried to kind of like take classes in quantitative methods because you recognize the ways in which like a neoliberal university valorized that specific kind of pursuit of knowledge. Like you say, um, you talk about like one, uh, climbing into bed with positivists because you were tired of, the, of fighting the fight and weary of speaking up in university and college level meetings about the merits of qualitative research. And so in terms of the things you were just talking about, Venus, in particular, the spree shooting in Buffalo, which is um, another in a series of uh, uh, racist, uh, genocidal spree shootings motivated by this kind of great replacement conspiracy theory rooted in white supremacy and Fox News and these forms of propaganda, it now becomes necessary, again, for activists, abolitionists, you know, people who have been all, like already trying to kind of, you know, make, cl make it clear how this violence has become uh, uh, ordinary in many ways, right? 58,000 gun deaths since Biden took office. It becomes necessary to, as you say, just reemphasize the existence of injustice. And I wonder to what extent you're at a point where it just, it, you know, to speak to what you're, you say in this article, Jennifer, it is like exhausting to have to just again uh, rehearse the sort of almost, you know, political drama of debating, you know, the roots of this sort of white supremacist violence, right? Like it is not clearly enough to just cite the numbers. Um, how do you make the reality of it felt? Um, and how do you make anti-racist uh, teaching feel as urgent as it needs to be in this particular moment? I think the reality is we don't have any other choice. I mean, we're, mm. we're raising children of color in this world who, you know, they're going out into a world and we're worried about their safety. Um, you know, we're, we're worried about what this new generation is going to be taught if you're not allowed to teach about systemic racism in K-12 schools in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's work that we can't stop because, you know, I don't want to speak for Venus, but for me, I feel like my life and the lives of my children depend on me continuing to engage in this labor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think as Venus mentioned earlier, you know, she and I grew up in this business together. And so it's not um, as if we ever felt um, that we fit in. So we always were bumping up against, you know, respectability politics and what a professor looked like or how a um, professor should act. And I think throughout our careers, neither one of us ever fully submitted to the notion of, you know, who is a professor, who gets to hold that authority. We really tried to just show up as our genuine selves in our work, in our presentations. And the reality is that sometimes our genuine selves weren't polished in a way that others would have liked because the reality is we are first generation academics. But we discussed this, we continue to discuss it. Um, and we knew we had to come correct in all that we did because otherwise people would come for us or doubt our work. So that made us want to work harder and you know, publish more. And you mentioned exhaustion. I mean, as women of color academics, we are exhausted all the time. So we're balancing other people's perceptions of who we are and whether we belong, but we're also dealing with the material consequences of white supremacy and of this violence that is becoming, you know, more and more real every day. People are enacting, um, you know, horrendous atrocities against our communities. Right, and glorifying it in live streams, um, right? Like it, there's a degree which it's this kind of you know, a defiant, um, you know, militarized effort um, to, you know, weaponize this sense of like white genocide that has been proffered by, um, you know, as I mentioned, like people, people like Tucker Carlson, these um, conservative mouthpieces that since especially 9-11 have really ramped up the rhetoric around this notion of the great replacement. 
um, this this big lie. And, and let's be clear, Scott, right? Uh, Western science, European science, academic science has fed, you know, into these types of uh, uh, body politics, right? Mm -hmm. So what justified the enslavement of African people? What justified the attempt at genocide of African people and indigenous people? Uh, you know, it, it was a eugenic science. It was about scientific racism uh, and this idea of who was superior, not superior, who was determined uh, they can conquer land and peoples and bodies of waters, even the, the sky, right? It's been mm -hmm. science that has been complicit and uh, perfecting the tools of the state. And I mean, like uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and so even at this, you know, so we, we can't ignore even the role of science and who's intellectually superior. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I think that, you know, that's what Jennifer and I set out to do. So we want to be clear that this project wasn't a, just a pedagogical uh, creation, Scott, it was a political act of resistance. Mm -hmm. we, we have a love for and, and care for our students. We have a love and care for our discipline, but we also understood that the way that our institutions and our disciplines were being conveyed to the other uh, was from a standpoint of innocence. And Jennifer and I knew that that wasn't true. So we can't separate the Tuckers and these young white supremacist terrorists from science. And mm -hmm. that's what Jennifer and I grappled with because we are the historians of science as much as we are the pedagogues of qualitative research. So we actually set out to unveil that very nasty genocidal history that the Academy has worked really hard to either cover up or to downplay. And I mean, I think you do it really powerfully. Um, you know, I see so many connections between your work and the kind of, you know, abolitionist and anti-racist feminism that's kind of emerging right now in this moment of, you know, of, of you know, where, as they say in abolition feminism now, it feels like historical time is accelerating. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, like, in the same way that Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang in their article, Unbecoming Claims, are trying to kind of politicize coding as a research practice, you are doing that same thing of kind of like providing the tools while also being self-reflexive and critical and resistant when it comes to, you know, imparting those tools. Um, but on that point of, of science, you know, as a, as a technology that is hostile to other ways of knowing, like, I interviewed uh, Wahakea Miley for the podcast, and he talks about like being a person who is an expert in settler colonialism, but also in the science of astronomy, because he's had to become one in, in order to resist these sorts of colonial projects that are, are expanding in, in Hawaii. And he talked about really feeling a degree of hostility in the spaces of, you know, scientific hegemony, where he was just like invited to speak, right? And I think like, the, the thing that I got from reading your textbook is that um, you're, you're aware of how like that, that um, you know, establishment knowledge, it just, it builds over time. It almost kind of ossifies over time. Um, and while you're citing Ahmed in a very Ahmedian way, you're not just like reliant on citation. Like, um, you know, uh, you have this idea that you take from Ahmed of methodology being in part a kind of citational chain where you know, you're supposed to kind of come in as a scholar having, you know, mastered this like set of discourses, and then you jump in and you add your kind of contribution. It's not, you know, you're, you're working through this in the textbook and, and specifically through Audre Lorde's indelible kind of metaphor of the master's tools. Um, elsewhere, you've written that you quote, understand Lord believed that by using the master's tools, we would only be able to temporarily beat him as, at his own game instead of enacting real change. Um, and, and yet you say you use the master's language in the field of research, because if we do not research and write about personal experiences, someone else will do it for us, perhaps without compassion or truth. Um, I wondered if you could just kind of speak to your restless relationship with citation, your own citational politics, 
you know, are citations sort of tools in your view? And, and where do they become kind of ossified and not helpful as paradigms? Hmm. I, I would say that we absolutely have a restless relationship to citational practices, as well as to, to research, if we want to be honest and transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to be real, then all of it is a colonial practice. Researching and writing about, about research is a colonial practice. I think that there are ways to disrupt the system. And one of the ways that I currently choose to do so is to work within, within, within and outside of spaces of academia that uh, continues to question these long held beliefs and practices, again, of the innocence of, of science. So stating that we need to be aware of our citational practices is a small disruption. Uh, will it end racism or sexism or both? Absolutely not, but we can encourage more people to be reflective about their research practices and theoretical ponderings and to cite women of color who are, who are doing the work, but often they're not getting credit for it. So when you ask whether you know, we see citations as, as tools, yes, they can be tools of disruption and they can also be uh, a narrative, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of how Catherine Bukitrick talks about citation is like part of a narrative, which I think is like really helpful. Um, for thinking about what what it does, right? What story it tells. Yeah, I I think it. I mean, the the important thing is it tells a majoritarian narrative, and so we say in the book that we can't um, claim a postmodern stance and eagerly accept the idea of multiple truths or multiple narratives only because there are some very real ways that some truths are valued over other truths. And we know this, I mean, we know that truths have different levels of acceptance by the majority. And so we wanna change that. And we also want to recognize that our embodied truth matters. And that's one of the things that, you know, we we talked about in the book. So I, I love the, um, the metaphor or it, the, the idea that we have this restless relationship to citational practices because we see the citational narrative, the majoritarian narrative as miseducation. And, you know, I think your colleague Elle Jones makes an important point in one of her poems. She talks about the miseducation of Black men when it comes to understanding the work of their Black sisters. And so miseducation is a deliberate practice. And we see the notion of following a citational change. So continuing to cite those researchers who have been cited continuously is a miseducation practice we're deliberately leaving pieces out of the story and allowing only certain people to get credit for the work. And this is how these majoritarian narratives get told and retold. Absolutely. Yeah. I recently read Bell Hooks where, uh, you know, she was kind of uh, thinking through this idea of who to cite and, you know, who not to cite without saying that. Uh, in that in, a, in a piece, she was also saying, oh, I would hate um, and I think it was, it was actually, it was a talk back on All About Love. And she was just saying that she would hate not to be able to cite other people beyond just say Black people. But I think from a researcher's perspective, especially, uh, you know, professors of research, the citational chain is a white colonial tradition that serves to uphold authority, to uphold power and patriarchal dependency. And, and people like Jennifer and I, we are trained to cite and in essence to worship European thought leaders who often upheld slaveocracy and believed in white superiority and, and male domination. Therefore, when we cite those who have been legitimated by the academy, we are conscientious that we're participating in scientific racism. However, we also know, Scott, that white people and white men did not discover science. European and European institutional, institutional Europeans definitely institutionalized and decided the rules or the standards of so-called, the so-called scientific method. And European men became the overseers of science, but they do not own science or scientific thought. And I think that's what we're trying to convey 
in this text are, are other pieces. Uh, and of course, even in our engagement in social media today, white men remain the gatekeepers of science. And in many ways, white women are the gatekeepers of qualitative research. Sometimes, Scott, we don't talk about that. But Jennifer and I, we've been very, very unapologetic of how although now we've carved out spaces in qualitative research, especially for black women, indigenous women, and other women of color, white women are still holding onto that space and in many ways deciding how it is to be uh knowledge is to be legitimated and our goal with this book was to open up the floodgates mm -hmm. using methodologies and languages and theories that were more familiar to our people our communities our identities and ways of na navigating academia and the social world uh so even when mm -hmm. i'm looking on social media for example things like twitter this book is being taken up by people in the medical profession, public health professionals, social workers, uh, people in STEM, uh, people in the traditional social sciences, and that we did that intentionally. We wanted to use mm -hmm. language in an aesthetic that was not only accessible, but familiar. So citations for us is a skill and it's a rhetorical device for manipulating language and the written word into a mapping a mapping of our stories. I remember early on, Venus, I'm sure you remember this too. We had a long discussion about who we would cite in the book. And we toyed with the idea of only citing women of color, researchers and theorists. And ultimately mm -hmm. we decided we're, you know, we're going to do a mix, but we will try to obviously privilege the work that resonates the most with us. I like Venus, your metaphor of the kind of opening of the floodgates. It's like, it's, it's more about how the book potentiates others power. Like it's, it's such an empathetic book in so many ways, especially in the way that it reflects on writing. And, you know, I, I want to use this as a way of segueing to a question, an, another question about sort of the game, right? Uh, you talk in ethical quandaries about like, the eponymous ethical quandary in that article is really whether you give students the tools to succeed in neoliberal university and thus just reproduce the structure or the means of changing the rules of the game in many ways. And it feels to me like this textbook attempts to change the rules of the game. And that's why it feels like a flood. And yet, you know, this is clearly like you building on past work to, that you've done, trying to kind of completely lay your cards on the table and ask whether you are, quote, hurting your students' chances of success inside and outside the academy by supporting them in their allegiance to marginalized paradigms. Venus is, has broken up with uh, academia, broken up with uh, the oppressor. Um, but do you still, I mean, and, and clearly, like, you're, you're trying to build these communities of care in, in which you don't have to worry so much about these ethical quandaries. But do you, do you still wonder whether you're putting students at a disadvantage in the neoliberal university by prioritizing um, or, uh, qualitative research, which is, is not necessarily the more lucrative path? I mean, is it is it about fundamentally trying to change the rules of the game from your perspective? It it definitely, you know, I would say um, I definitely feel this dilemma in mentoring students. And, you know, when mm -hmm. Venus was in the academy, I mean, she and I would talk about this. But the truth is, I think we would think similarly if we were helping mentor students who wouldn't be reflective about research and ethics. So the academy mm. has become you know, so increasingly neoliberal, and we know that knowledge is now commodified. And in this neoliberal system, certain knowledges are worth more on the free market. So when we mentor students to engage in knowledge that has less value across the system, we definitely have to be upfront with them. And the most beautiful thing that I find is that students are already know this, and yet they still choose to help their communities and to engage in the type of knowledge that won't make them rich, but also will not destroy the communities they love. Absolutely. Um, Venus, I don't know if you wanted to follow up immediately on that. I had a little thing I was going to say, but uh, feel free to jump in. I, I was just thinking about the idea of self-reflexivity and I thought, 
you know, Jennifer and I, we've never taken, taken certain institutionalized words for granted. So some of these terminologies and practices that you see in qualitative research, and I think it's obvious in our introduction <laughs> to the book, <laughs> they actually come from indigenous communities and mostly women indigenous communities, communities that we are indigenous too. And I was just thinking, oh, oh, Jennifer, you sound like a teacher. That's what I was thinking. But then I was also thinking my questioning of self-reflexivity uh, clearly comes from my background and social work, right? So if, if you think about who our researchers are, and I mean, you know, post a, a male dominated field, especially in qualitative research uh, or not, right? <laughs> I, I was thinking that these are terminologies that sort of come from quote unquote, the helping field, but they are, and this goes back to your question, Scott, they are disconnected from the disciplines and practices and communities where they originated from. And I think L. Jones mm -hmm. also speaks to that, right? So um, they are they're they're pedagogical. We we have teacher reflexivity or teacher reflections. Uh, obviously, for me as even as a clinician and working at a policy think tank, we're always we always have to think where am I? We have to do these check ins. Okay, um, am I not mm -hmm. only connecting with my client, but how am I feeling about what they're saying? Right. Um, and so it's interesting, though, how this terminology, self-reflexivity, it reminds me of, OK, I have to take these notes alongside my observations in this field, you know, out in the field. But are these just notes that are disconnected from our heart space, our, our heart chakras, uh, who we are as spiritual beings, uh, who we are as nurturers and caregivers and who we are as human beings who feel as opposed to this inauthentic uh, practice of detailing our observations and our connectedness or disconnectedness to the observations being made. You know, I feel like we have worked really hard to be vulnerable in, you know, in all of our writing, in all of our work that we've gone beyond this textbook definition of self-reflexivity. I feel like we've put mm -hmm. our souls out there. We've laid ourselves bare in the same way that, you know, so many researchers want participants to bear themselves. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, I think we've, we've done that because we've done the work. We've done not only the intellectual work, but the emotional labor. And I, I think that we're able to be self-reflexive because you and I, we've played together, we've cried together, we've theorized together, we've read together, we've written together, we've spoken together, we've danced together, we've come up with song lyrics together, right? <laughs> and, and I don't think that in the academy, especially the neoliberal commodified academy, individualism is actually, you know, not only it, you, someone could profiteer off of it, but that's what it promotes, right? This McDonaldized uh, idea of what is research. You're an individual, you go through the drive-through, you know, you order one, two, or three, what's your observation? This is what I got, this is how I'm thinking. But you and I, for the last 20 years, we're literally sharing, this is my lecture. These are my assignments. I'm going to add this to this assignment. This is what the student said. This is what the student should have said, right? This is the experience I have with my department chair. This is the experience I have with my dean. This is how we're going to present this lecture, right? This is how we can improve this assignment. And I, I think that in the disconnectedness from the human experience and this type of jockeying to be seen and heard as the expert, I think some of that is lost in self-reflective practices where you and I, <laughs> we were holding each other accountable because we can honestly say, girl, that ain't even you talking, <laughs> right? You're, no, you're right. And I, and I feel like the relationship, the sisterhood that we cultivated, it, it was important both professionally, you know, it, I think it, we, what we put together built our careers, helped build our careers. But I think it was so impactful 
personally as well. So you talked about that emotional aspect. And I, I do feel like I'm a better person for having cultivated this relationship with you and for having to, you know, question things that maybe other people wouldn't have pushed me hard enough on. Um, I'm just ha happy to listen to you talk, <laughs> to talk about this. It's the same way reading the book, right? Um, the way that you write lets listeners in, readers into your your thought processes in a way that is uh, vulnerable, that is open, um, and that isn't just about sort of like you you use that metaphor, uh, Venus of like McDonald's, right? Like there's a way in which McDonald's not only makes consumption too quick and too easy, too kind of like low nutrition, high, whatever, like high, just kind of immediate pleasure. But it also like McDonald's as an institution was really responsible for like de-skilling labor and making labor more and more mechanical. So it's like, you're just supposed to kind of like map out for students. Here's A, B, and C. Now go do it. This is how you code um, and not necessarily reflect on your own place in it, your own, your own embodied place. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you about because you talked about like trying to push past this kind of reduction of terms like self-reflexivity into just like institutionalized words that are taken for granted. That immediately made me think again about like the way that Sarah Ahmed writes about diversity um, as a mostly tokenistic kind of PR oriented thing for the most part, in which, as she says, um, a, a fantasy of inclusion is actually a technique of exclusion. Um, you know, we're in a moment where EDIA or equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, accessibility has become increasingly kind of hegemonic normative. And so like that itself from a lot of, for, certainly from Ahmed's point of view is a kind of risk in some ways, like it, it can become toothless and, and kind of like emptied of content to some extent. Do you see it in those terms for the most part, just like from your own experience? Or do you also like see the potential for that like moment as an opening where you can kind of like leverage the becoming normative of actually being responsible to forms of difference, the inclusion of communities of color, the inclusion of, you know, the historically marginalized in these powerful institutions? Like, how do you balance that? I think... You know, DEI, at least in U.S. institutions, has become, you know, this is the latest buzzword. And I feel like it has become toothless. I mean, it, it's used so often now with so little reflection and, and with such little power behind it. Um, so to, to me, I guess it's frustrating. Um, and it's like it, there's something about it that feels so co-opted and co-opting it's analogous sorry i don't mean to cut you off but to me it's analogous in some ways to the ways in which the republican party is attacking critical race theory and like appropriating the words of for example martin luther king jr i spoke to rebecca wanzo about this recently uh, you know the fact that this idea that it's about the content of your care uh, character not the color of your skin for that to be appropriated by the right as a means of basically like advocating uh, a post-racial society of just pure individualism, it's it's similar in some ways, this kind of like inclusion of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the academy. Um, it just, it, you know, it, it seems to try and inoculate dissent or or opposition in some ways, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, you know, the Republican Party has taken that MLK quote and they've used it in such a narrow context. They're not reading what what comes before it and what comes after it. And so it is a way of mm. co-opting. And, you know, that I guess that's what we're used to. I mean, especially in the academy, we're used to things that, you know, scholars of color create being co-opted and almost tamed in this neoliberal institution. And so, you know, you had mentioned earlier in the podcast um, that as a white man, you do feel like you need to be an ally and help us chip away. And I feel that is the only way that the co-option will stop is if white academics, white people in general, turn around and say, okay, enough is enough. Now, let me engage. Let me do this labor of anti-racist work. And make myself vulnerable, right? Like That's right. And admit what I don't know, right? Like, I think that's, 
that's always the kind of thing that I, I run up against. I've been reading in preparation for an upcoming interview, uh, a new book called Disarm, Dis- Defund, Dismantle on, on Police Abolition in Canada. And one of the things they talk about is how, you know, like it is not a fad to talk about abolition, even though it feels brand new. And there's this way in which like academics are in some ways opportunistically trying to, you know, capitalize basically on the language of abolition. This is something that the black feminist activists, scholars and organizers have been talking about for a very long time. And as they say in that book, that's the reason why in 2020 abolition was suddenly kind of everywhere and on everyone's lips. The reason why is they put it, it's, it was legible is because of the groundwork laid by um, especially black feminist thinkers, you know? Um, so I think like just having a degree of uh, self-effacement in the face of like th- those moments of realizing I simply don't know that, you know, these things that seem brand new to me um, have an incredibly long tradition. And I think, you know, there's a lot in your book about that, um, you know, and, and you're, you're trying to re-engage with some of these traditional ways of producing knowledge uh, and reproducing a picture of specific communities. Like I wanted to ask you, for example, about this idea of a deficit narrative. I think it's similar, like frequently anthropologists, sociologists, especially maybe w- will foreground the pain and suffering and maybe pathology within particular communities without reflecting on their own desires and investments as researchers. And that, you know, immediately to me connected with the way that you talk about this idea in the book of a deficit narrative uh, that exists within research on communities of color. You've also written about the responsibility you feel um, as thinkers, as organizers, as, as advocates to, quote, disrupt deficit thinking and narratives of pathology of black and brown communities. Um, and I wonder if you could just like try and explain that idea of this sort of, sort of deficit narrative, why you feel it's like such an entrenched thing, even in like, you know, the highest levels of like, you know, uh, of, of quantitative and qualitative research, there is this tendency, right? To reduce communities of color to pain, struggle, pessimism, um, but you're trying to kind of counteract that, right? I mean, I think reducing communities of color to deficit narratives, to pain, to struggle, is what helps keep white supremacy alive. Mm. And that is why the scientific project continues to engage in that. And it's one of the reasons why we say intersectional research is an intentional interruption to that. We we don't want to continue that practice. And I, it was Charles Payne, and I believe it was 1996, his book, he's a, he's a sociologist. He wrote uh, the book, Getting What We Ask For in Urban mm-hmm. Ed Reform. I think that's the subtitle. And you know, that's that's like the that book and that that questioning of education, educational research in particular is what made me begin to like dive, <laughs> dive and dig into the rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. And that's where I began to learn more about eugenicism and scientific racism. And Jennifer will tell you, too, that's when I became angry, Scott. Mm-hmm. That's when I felt bamboozled, to you know, to use, um, you know, the, the words of, of Spike Lee. Uh, hoodwinked. And I said, "Uh uh-oh. So believe it or not, even when we're teaching research methodologies and purposes, we always ask our students to start off. we, We say, what is the purpose of your research? What is the problem? And so Jennifer and I, you know, 15 years ago or more, we decided to stop asking that question. Oh, you know, what is your topic? What is your research interest as opposed to what is the educational problem? What is the scientific problem, right? And Mm. so if you're going to intuitively start with your own community, whether that's women, queer people, black and brown people, indigenous people, we're already locating the problem within the community as opposed to uh, policy and white supremacy. Uh, and, And we're starting, like eugenicism or scientific racism starts with indigeneity and you know communities of color and women as the problem, and and so Charles Payne says we're getting exactly what we're asking for. Why do kids drop out of school? Why 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 are immigrant people of immigrant populations poor? 
Why are black children not learning? Why are poor children not learning? Why are rural students failing? Why, you know, and so it's this this uh, fascination with with death and dying, and it's a fascination with proving that white is right and everything else is broken. Um, and, and you can hear that, right? You can hear my anger with that stance. Mm -hmm. uh, we very rarely in research circles ask what is working. So even if you look at my earlier work, I start with that premise. So I come from a background where Black girls were succeeding even in the face of adversity. Yet when I walked into, you know, sociologic, sociology classrooms or psych classrooms, I was always, uh, you know, reading about what was wrong with the black community. Why are why do we have so much black teen pregnancy? Why? Why are so many black people in poverty? Right. So you you are automatically starting with what's wrong with, with communities of color. Why are certain people broken? Why, why are people backwards? So we're getting exactly what we asked for. So what happens when we focus on on joy? What happens when we focus on movement? struggles what happens when we focus on meaning making or our pleasures and uh i'm not sure that we we have the answer to that question yet i'm not even sure um that we're at a point where we can only ask those types of questions um so i got caught in my own thinking for example when you ask the question about deficit and problems. And I automatically thought about um, my work over uh, at the African American Policy Forum and the Say Her Name Project uh, led by Kimberly Crenshaw. And I watched Micaiah Bryan mm. get killed at the hands of a white police officer who was on the scene for, I believe, less than 11 seconds. And I watched the recording 17 times. And Micaiah, Micaiah Bryan, a 16 year old, was shot blank blank uh, in less than eight seconds, 10 seconds, four times. Yeah. And they just let her body lay there on the cold concrete with her belly showing and, and you know, blood pulling out. That's science, too. Mm. And who has the courage to tell that? Who has the courage to add up the numbers in the way that I just did? <laughs> who has the numbers to think about social policy and social patterns and to instinctively say, my research mind went to, oh my God, that police officer didn't think. I said, wow, I wonder if he's military trained. I wonder if he's a sharp suitor, come to find out he was. But I also went back to, again, there's a science yeah. to not seeing Black children as ch children. There's a science to being afraid of Black bodies. There's a science to a militarized urban community. There's a science to how to kill a civilian who you perceive as a threat. Um, and, and there's a science to, to studying that phenomenon in a way that you don't become so debilitated that you can't act. And there's a science, Scott and Jennifer, to activating and galvanizing your community on the side of democracy. Uh, we can use science to unveil uh, inequality, and we can also use science to fight for equity in a multiracial democracy. But how can we, in ethical ways, tell the truth so that we can embolden those who want to use intellectual activism as a a weapon that does less harm. Wow, um, you know, I I hear what you're saying. I think this idea that there's a kind of science to settler colonialism itself that these are not accidents, that these are not bad apples, these are not exceptions. These are, um, you know, this is the outcome of um, a militarized police force that has no accountability whatsoever, that doesn't have to share data about its practices, um, that is seen as the only means of providing community safety. Like that's all very scientific. Um, and yet it's reproduced. It's like naturalized by cultural means, by propaganda. Um, and so this is where I think the kind of mixed methods approach that you're advocating in some ways in the book um, that, that centers the question of transformative justice is is so you know impactful in 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 so many ways. I mean, like you're it, it's it's at the same you know at the same time that there's this level of humility around saying like in the book as you write 
can we even know how we as researchers truly shape a study? There is also this like incredibly, um, you know, resolute voice that says like, this world is as Gloria Anzal Duo says, like one in which we daily have to accept the shocking nature of just normalized mass death or, or as you know, Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore says like the, the kind of racially structured uh, uh, vulnerability of people of color to premature death, like where we're just supposed to accept that um, as endemic to particular communities and not others. So like, this is not a good world and it could have been otherwise. And I think like, that's what the book in, in many ways is trying to get us to do is just like in imagining a world in which we are less precarious, where in which there is uh, um, ample abundance and, and that abundance is distributed equally. And the truth of it is like you mentioned the Buffalo shooter, you know, he wrote this long racist diatribe in which he cites these false notions, like these, these made up facts about, you know, black welfare recipients costing the state $700,000 in their lifetime. Right. And that too is about, as, as Jennifer was saying, how this like deficit narrative keeps white supremacy alive. Like he was citing that as justification for a spree shooting. And it's again about this kind of pipeline of scientific knowledge motivating white settler violence in the current moment. Um, and so I just, yeah, um, you just, the way you speak really kind of got me going there, Venus. Um. Uh, well, I was just, I mean, what Venus said was, you know, brilliant and beautiful and powerful. Um, I, and I did just want to connect it back to citational practices because none of this is by accident. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, very well coordinated. And, you know, the academy is training people to cite science that engages in the deficit narratives. And so, you know, when you're in graduate school and you're reading these um, research that, you know, kind of centers communities of color struggle and pathology, in some ways you don't know any better. And so, you know, I do think it goes back to citational practices and the fact, you know, Venus used the word bamboozled. And, you know, she and I have talked about this. Um, you know, we felt bamboozled because we didn't start reading about decolonial work until after graduate school. We were in these traditional qualitative classes and we were trying to build a bridge between what we were learning there um, versus what we were learning in women's studies and African-American studies and critical theory classes. And so we realized that decolonial work had been pondering these questions for a while. And I think that's the power of these citational practices because decolonial work hadn't even been on our radar because the theorists and the researchers that we were reading in graduate school hadn't cited that body of work. This is where I think your, your book is, is so, um, you know, like useful to use an Ahmedian kind of phrase again, right? Like it is, it is something that gets us to think about how um, you know those exclusions are almost sort of utilitarian strategic exclusions. Um, like in the book, you say racism and sexism are institutionalized in all aspects of life, including research. Um, you you how you say and and this is I, I guess um, I wanted to ask about the this this idea in the book that uh, perfectionism itself among writers is raced and gendered. I love the chapter in the textbook on writing strategies and rituals um, where you talk about perfectionism and where it comes from in a way that I have never seen it written about before. Um, you say that you, when you're told by your students that writing is happening, you're not sure whether to have faith um, because you know how fragile the writing practice can sometimes be, including especially, of course, like the way COVID has really dis disrupted everything. Um, you know, why was it important for you to talk, speak to the ways that writers um, uh, negotiate perfectionism as a deeply raced and gendered thing um, and, and just take a step back and think about like not just why they're writing, but what is what it means to write and how to find pleasure in writing. Mm, yes, pleasure, pleasure in writing. So 
um, you know, it should be clear, uh, Scott, to you and, and to your listeners and to researchers, to to one, you know, people who want to work within the academy, that Jennifer and I, we've been attacked. <laughs> we've been attacked for our teaching. Uh, we've been a, a, attacked for our po- our organized politics outside of the academy. Uh, we've been you know, harassed and, and attacked for even our, our choice in curriculum and how we want to hold space for students. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also with that said, so it's one thing to be just, you know, attacked for your, you know, material condition as being, you know, black and brown women in the academy. Uh, but we also have experienced, and I think one of the first times we were hit hard was the Trayvon Martin, you know, murder. Uh, that hurt us in ways that we weren't prepared for. I think for our generation of scholars, we had to contend with our place as, you know, people who were, uh, you know, taught to come in and kind of teach to a predominantly white young audience uh, about education, about research, critical pedagogy, emancipatory and liberatory practices in your classrooms and community spaces. But here we were, you know, for our time, it was the Emmett Till of our story of our time. Mm. Uh, so we couldn't disconnect anymore from what we were teaching in our classrooms and what we were living uh, in real time. And so uh, with that said, you know, I have a theory that for people of color, for women of color and people from working class backgrounds, who enter academia, we, we, they, they're entering, especially at this time where higher ed is always being marketed to them, um, that they really enter it because they are interested in writing. They find pleasure in writing. They find pleasure in reading and thinking deeply about Trayvon Martin, uh, Sandra Bland, Ahmaud Arbery, right? Because I mm-hmm. think Jennifer was one of the first people I called when Ahmaud Arbery was killed. Um, but, but they want to think about this. And, and many of us find ourselves in classrooms or learning situations where the types of books assigned, the provocative ways of presenting ideas about oppression and subjugation or joy are mm-hmm. not present, or they are mere side notes in, in coursework. So by the time that graduate students get to research questions, They have already lost their interest in writing or they begin to question their own writing abilities. They become discontent with the writing process itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, writing is such a huge part of research, but many students from marginalized communities are taught in universities that there's only one way of writing or one way of thinking critically, one way of being scientific. So then writing or, you know, this idea of writing up our research becomes a dispassionate chore and it's separate from our cultural ways of expression. So we believe that, you know, when students are silent, when they, you know, when they kind of disconnect from us and tell us that they're writing, they're actually working through anxieties of writing. And our role has always been to help them rediscover their authentic Mm -hmm. authorial voice. And, you know, at times the writing up of research is done in solitude. Other times it can be done in community. And, you know, we try to bring our students together to kind of share in that writing, in those writing practices. but there's always some type of relationship with a mentor to kind of guide you through finding your voice and reconnecting your voice with cultural ways of expression that are often stripped from us in academia. I think that a muse relationship is also important. Again, going back to ideas of indigenous research, uh, or the reasons why people from indigenous communities uh, explore their environment, their physical environment, uh, you know, the heavens, the skies, the bodies of water, plant life, animal life. It was so that we can all be 
in 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 sync. Yeah. Um, and, and so when I think about that, I do think that that muse relationship feeds into a ritual, rituals around the purposes of research, rituals around how do we uh, investigate, you know, plant life, animal life, uh, water, human life, social interactions, our relationships with institutions and systems. I think we do need to go back to those indigenous ways. And I think rituals are important. I, I know for a fact, <laughs> as, a, as a clinician and as a meditation teacher and a, a hypnotist, a hypnotherapist, that hmm. rituals also work for the psyche. And I think we don't talk about that. So Jennifer has a ritual, you know, around, you know, when she writes, how she writes, how she thinks about research, how she conveys her, you know, her research. I certainly do. Um, even my book, The Boss Chick's Guide to Mindfulness Meditation, it was written after my book, Black Feminism and Qualitative Research, because, again, I wanted to lift the veil on how you become a contemplative researcher, an ethical researcher, a mindful researcher, a Black feminist thinker and researcher uh, who doesn't um, recycle, you know, white superiority and, and colonial ways of being and thinking uh, about uh, the social world. And so it's going to look different. It, it might be. I'm inspired by, you know, I was inspired uh, when we were writing uh, this text by mostly hip hop artists. I was inspired by uh, social social movements, the Black Lives Matters movement, uh, the fight against you know Trump and Trumpism at that particular time. Um, and, and so I think that we that's a part of this you know these uh, ways of being in the academy that are transformative. Is we should talk more about our non-stated practices, such as our rituals. And I think that's another mm -hmm. layer of interruptions. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I think like this is this this interview, this this discussion feels like the culmination of so many of the conversations I've had for this podcast, because like I, I'm just getting flashes myself of like past conversations with people like Anna Singh, who writes about that connection to um, spaces to the earth, to, you know, mushrooms, to like the actual stuff around her and how like in her early training as an anthropologist, she felt like she was reading books by dead white men that really were, you know, ultimately useless for the kind of work that she wanted to do. I say that this is the culmination also knowing that this book that you've written is the culmination of, as you say, like a couple of decades of thinking about these things. The other thing I wanted to ask about is um, the way that the book tries to model an ethical relationship with participants in research studies. The book contains really invaluable tips for interviewers. Like you talk about being non-judgmental, being self-aware about your body language, and while trying to be as respectful as possible, still trying to be kind of probing and, and pressing your participants on um, you know, their presuppositions. You you both mentioned Elle Jones and some of her poetry and some of her thinking. Like um, I taught uh, uh, your work alongside her in my research methods class, and one of the examples that Elle used in the class was uh, Zora Neale Hurston's highly intimate and personalized research. And I wondered if you could think through the way that your book kind of advocates for an ethical relationship between interviewer and interviewee in terms of what. Jones calls like intimacy in creating this kind of black feminist epistemology. Like in the book, you're talking about developing trust and getting permission to become part of your participants' worlds. That's not just an ethical, but also like a deeply emotional social thing. You talk about like moving past rapport toward this notion of trust. Um, like, how are you sort of trying to model that for interviewers? And where do you see, I mean, you've kind of spoken to this a little bit already, but where do you see? the ways that interviewing is has been codified in like institu institutional ethics boards, for example, as like kind of problematic or limiting? Um, well, I, I think we talk about Zora Neale Hurston and Gloria Anzal Dua in the book and really the feminism that our, forma, that our foremothers were creating centered the body. It was always about the, 
body politic. And so we try to center the body in most of what we do, because as we've said in many other pieces of our writing, the body has material consequences. So it can never be divorced from our experiences. And mm -hmm. it's funny, you, you know, bring up the idea of developing rapport and then, you know, moving on to trust, because when we first wrote the chapter on engaging with participants, I remember I wrote a sentence that used the term developing rapport and Venus challenged me on it. She was absolutely correct that we need to go beyond developing rapport. The rapport idea didn't even begin to encapsulate the fact that we literally ask people to bear their souls to us in interviews um, or allow us into the most intimate parts of their lives. So yes, research is an incredibly intimate practice and recognition and respect for that intimacy is a black feminist practice. Venus, do you remember um, mm -hmm. challenging me on that, you know, developing rapport, telling me I, I was sounding very traditional? <laughs> no, I don't. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, that was such a powerful moment for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think too. If I re, if I, I do recall what what was happening is I was going through this transition where I felt like not only had the academy become complicit, I felt like we weren't being real and that we were perpetuating the status quo. And I said, really, rapport isn't enough. That's the, that's the easy way in. It's the easy way of easing into our participants, our research participants' lives. So at this moment, Scott, I wanted to quit. I wanted to quit research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. That this is not right. Uh, many, uh, I was questioning all of IRB. I was questioning all of, uh, you know, institutional re review boards and their protocols for working with human subjects. And I was thinking that many of the people that we research with, they don't even understand what they're giving consent to. So mm -hmm. rapport from a very superficial um position is something to the extent, okay, we've just met each other, you know what the research is about. I asked you about the weather. And I'm thinking, right? And I'm thinking like, whoa, we're about to, because the, the, the people who Jennifer and I research with, and who our students were, the communities they were interested in researching, and we were asking them to divulge past sexual history. We were talking about their relationships with with their teachers, with their caregivers, uh, their mentors. We were asking them to uh, remember acts of racism and racial violence. Uh, and, I, and so rapport wasn't enough. So mm -hmm. what else, what am I giving up on about myself? So what am I going to reveal about who I am? Uh, and so it was something that we needed to get beyond rapport, right? Um, and that's what I was thinking about that authenticity. So not this top down hierarchical hegemonic ways of thinking about how we relate to people. So if we were going back to the family reunion, if we were returning to the neighborhood block parties, how do we get to know our long lost cousins who we haven't met before or have we, we haven't seen in years or how do I, you know, began to you know, form relationships with people who were similarly aligned, but but knowing that uh, this was probably going to be a one way relationship for all intents and purposes. Right. And so I said, no, let's think about this. How do we authentically build relationships with our cousins and them? That's moving beyond rapport and that's re reciprocity because now it's a mutual exchange. We're in this together. You have something to gain, I have something to gain. If you have something to lose, I have something to lose. And if not, Scott, <laughs> if not, then let's be transparent and say more than likely, I'm probably gonna get more out of this experience than you. And that can be a PhD, 
or a degree. That can be tenure and promotion. That can be speaking engagements. That might be book contracts. But we needed to be more clear and transparent about the hierarchies of research. And I think, I mean, you just you you so are in the book. And so I think, I just I really appreciate hearing you speak to the work that you're doing. Like this idea of just trying to rethink the institution. These these seemingly intractable things like an institutional review board these things that you can't work around without completely divorcing yourself from the institution you say these boards tend to be biomedical they tend to be about protecting the university that they're they're too bureaucratic and it's like you're trying to actually deepen the conversation and say like who benefits who's being exploited and is the actual like goal some form of reciprocity transformation or is it really just about like you say, like credentialism, um, you know, and and commodifying knowledge, because of course, like on some level, students do want the the cookie cutter way to succeed in in a neoliberal university and in in an, and under neoliberal capitalism. But what you're both saying is like, we need to as a society, as as communities that care about one another, that want to be more connected, chip away at that, and figure out a way to to you know. Uh, devise a, a deeper sort of like intimacy, connectedness, and I don't know. I don't even know what the words are. I think I'm still working through it. Um, and that's that. That's a valuable thing to be kind of encouraged to do. So I mean, yeah. Thanks so much for writing the book, for making the time to talk to me about it. It's been great. Thank you, Scott. This has been a great opportunity to reflect on some of our practices. Uh, where are we at now in our our careers and also what is our relationship with science and research for sure yeah thank you scott for doing this